Hi guys, Jim Vodonsky with Manufacturing Talks. Back a couple months ago, I was honored to speak in Helena, Montana at the Montana Manufacturing and International Trade Days. I spoke about manufacturing in general and about what Montana has going, especially in its favor, to attract more manufacturing. So for this episode, I have that speech. I get to uh, use it with the kind permission of the Montana Chamber of Commerce and the Montana Manufacturing Association. So thanks to them. And of course, thanks to our sponsor, DYS Media. Stay tuned and listen in on what my thoughts are about the world state of manufacturing and what Montana is getting right here on Manufacturing Talks. Welcome to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vinosky. Industry has a million cool stories and Jim talks to the movers and shakers who are making them happen. Let's dive in. EYS Media, your digital media relations agency. Public relations, website design, digital marketing. You get found by the customers and talent who need your solutions. You get media placements in top publications, the best job candidates coming to your website, a digital presence that gets you found by the right people. Call 616-298-8798 to get started today. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Jim Vanosky. We're really thrilled to have Jim with us today to deliver our keynote address. Jim has spent his entire three-decade career in manufacturing in products ranging from paints and plastics to food and bourbon. His focus has been in engineering, operations, and management. He's a veteran of companies large and small, including Ralston, Purina, and General Mills. Jim is president of Cosgrove Content, LLC, which provides media services to the industry. Jim is the host of Manufacturing Talks, a web show and podcast featuring valuable business lessons the do or die world of manufacturing has to offer. As a contributor for Forbes, Jim has published over 200 articles covering all facets of manufacturing and supply chain. He's explored a variety of topics in his column, the success stories of numerous American manufacturers, the war for talent, the amazing innovations in our advanced technologies such as 3D printing, bioengineering, and artificial intelligence. Jim is an avid cyclist and outdoorsman and is scoutmaster for the troop his two teenage sons are in. He lives with them and his wife in Granville, Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Jim Vanosky. It is great to be back in Montana. You know, I'm from Michigan as as Scott said, and you know, you get to this time of the year, this time of the winter in Michigan, and there's nothing like hopping on a plane and coming somewhere colder and snowier. <laughs> so yeah, that was a little, of a little bit of a downer, but no, it really is great to be back here. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in your beautiful state. I have been across it a number of times. So when I was a kid, I grew up in Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula, and my mom grew up in Oregon. And so every other summer, we would travel across the country in a station wagon with a family of seven. So don't get me wrong, loved crossing your state, loved my family to death. This trip, despite the cold and snow, has been much cushier than that. Okay, uh, so I got back to Montana just last year. Now I'm gonna admit, Montana was not on my radar with all that fancy stuff that Scott covered that I get to talk about and write about and study in my work for Forbes and on my web show. Didn't have Montana on my radar. Two years ago though, I had written about the company that Todd mentioned, that John Suh here runs, New Horizon Studios. Uh, crazy little arm of Hyundai that is, well, at the time, they were just designing this ultimate mobility vehicle. So this wheeled vehicle whose wheels turn into legs, and it can go anywhere. And that was really cool, so I wrote about it for Forbes, and then forgot about it for a while, until I got a call last fall from Matt Olson from the chamber, saying, you know, you really ought to come out to Bozeman, because you remember what you wrote about with John Suh? He told me about that, and they're building an R&D center, and they're going to be making these things. 
And so that was too cool. So yeah, I went to Bozeman last fall, uh, went to their manufacturing days out there and learned about all that John has going on, which is phenomenal. Learned about how he selected Bozeman with Montana State and Gallatin College and all the skilled young people that uh, can get funneled to his business that way. The, the terrain that's perfect for, for uh, testing an ultimate mobility vehicle. And the stuff that Todd just talked about. I learned about all the initiatives that you have going on with the business community, with the schools, with the legislature, with Governor Gianforte to make Montana a more attractive place for manufacturing. And so I got studying that. And like Scott said, I wrote about it for Forbes because it was, I think, a great example for the whole country, what we ought to be doing for manufacturing. Then I had Scott on my show, and now I'm out here to talk about why I think you guys are doing so well. So I'm going to start with a quick quiz. Anyone heard of James J. Hill? Who is he? Yes. Alistair, you're amazing. You know, Alistair, when I was in Bozeman, had a, a hat that was made in my hometown. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's not Alistair. Sorry, you guys look alike. Holy cow. Forget about that story, but, but Alistair did have a hat that was made in my hometown that I used in my speech there. But thank you. Yes, James J. Hill was one of the titans of railroading back in the 19th century when railroads were first crossing the whole country. Now, he was born in Canada and spent most of his life in St. Paul, Minnesota. But he had strong ties to Montana, because obviously he's taken a rail line across. It was the, the Great Northern Railway at the time. It became Burlington Northern. And his company discovered the Marias Pass, which cut 100 miles off their route west, made his railway that much more uh, attractive. And along the way, as they built their railroad, they established a lot of the communities along its route. And so um, glad to know that he's still known in Montana. Now, don't feel bad if you didn't know who he is, because I didn't either until I came across an article I'll talk about here at the end of my speech. But so what does he have to do with manufacturing in Montana today? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you because that's why I flew halfway across the country, right? Um, but before I do, let me talk about manufacturing in general. I'll start with the world, okay? Manufacturing in the world is a bit of a mess. So I'm going to refer to some stuff that are tied, things that are tied to the pandemic. I mean, everyone remembers the supply chain nightmares and, and the difficulty in getting things. But a few things in particular um, that have currency today uh, are, are two locations. And one is China. You know, obviously everyone has China on their mind in manufacturing. They've been a tough competitor for a couple of decades. They've grown substantially and, and taken a lot of our business. Um, but in the pandemic, all of a sudden, you couldn't get, get stuff from China. And so today they're trying to claw back business that they lost during the pandemic because they failed as suppliers. And, you know, those of you in manufacturing know, you count on your suppliers for your lifeblood. And so when they failed, a lot of people started looking elsewhere. Then they compounded their error and they tried to contain an airborne virus by shutting whole, you know, hundreds of millions of people at a time, shutting them down and keeping them from doing the work of getting the business back. And that was just in the last few months. I mean, they're just now kind of coming to their senses and realizing the rest of the world has pretty much moved on from this thing and we're only hurting ourselves. So now they're trying to, trying to dig out and, and trying to get business back. But um, you've seen people talking about getting out of China. Heck, Foxconn, which I'm not a huge fan of because they took a bunch of government money from Wisconsin next to us and then didn't deliver the goods, but Taiwanese company that's wanting to get out of China, I just read today. That kind of tells you some of the difficulties they have. The other places, Europe in general, but I'm going to focus on Germany. So Germany, you know, heavily industrialized country, right? Um, phenomenal manufacturers in Germany and have been for time immemorial. And then Europe as a whole, and Germany in particular, got on the renewable energy bandwagon. 
Okay, nothing wrong with renewable energy. It is going to be part of the mix to help us cut emissions, which say what you want about global, global warming. We're affecting the atmosphere. We probably ought to scale it back smartly. And I'll talk about that in a while. Germany, I don't think, did it smartly. So back at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, under their former Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel, they instituted a program called Energiewende, basically saying transitioning to a whole new energy system, right? So they started shutting down fossil fuel plants. And then after the Fukushima disaster in Japan, they started shutting down their nuclear plants and going whole hog on wind and solar. And prices started going up, and energy reliability started going down. And that's not a good thing in manufacturing, is it? So we look at Germany now, and we've had another thing happen called Ukraine. We've had a related thing happen called Nord Stream. And now Germany is looking not only at people not having energy to heat their homes and run their general businesses, but manufacturers actually pulling out of Germany, of one of the most industrialized countries in the world. A 4,000 person BASF plant has already scaled back greatly. The town they're in thinks they're on their way out and that they're the tip of the iceberg. And imagine what that's gonna mean for a society that has hung its hat on manufacturing. And so, there are lessons to be learned here, right? So the world, you know, it's not going away. Globalization is not going away. And, it, and this is International Trade Days for, for a reason, right? That's a good thing to focus on. But there are things people are doing that we can learn from and strengthen ourselves here in the US. Now, let's talk about the US, okay? so. The U.S., and, and I'll go back to the pandemic, what happened? Geez, we get into it and we shut ourselves down and everyone's worried about their health and people are getting sick and we start looking for PPE and we start looking for respirators. Where do they all come from? China, yeah, where we can't get them. We realize that like 95% of all these medical devices and even pharmaceuticals are coming from China and we can't get them in this, you know, the terror-stricken days of the early pandemic. And yeah, just a disaster. Um, more generally speaking, supply chain breakdown, right? All these lengthy supply chains, whether it was China or Taiwan or wherever things were coming from, you couldn't get those things either. A couple personal bits, um, bicycles and pool tables. Why do I bring those up? Because <laughs> I was buying them. <laughs> Um, two or three weeks after lockdown, you know, everyone's looking, okay, what are we doing with ourselves? My wife wanted a new bike. And so we went to the local bike shop, which is normally wall-to-wall -wall bicycles, seven bicycles in the shop. Now we got lucky because they actually had the very bike she wanted in the size she needed. And needless to say, we snapped that right up. A week later, we went and ordered a pool table. So our boys, my two sons, teenagers, the scouts, would have something to do because scouts were shut down too. And not as lucky. So this is March 2020. The place we bought it from said, yeah, thanks for your order. You might get it in September. Really? Yeah, that doesn't come from America either. We got it in March 2021. So talk about opportunity. Now think about what companies did around the PPE and everything. American manufacturers were heroes. People who had nothing to do with PPE, nothing to do with respirator parts, launched into business. Some of them were shut down on their own businesses because they weren't essential. Yeah, don't get me started on that. Um, but they made their businesses work by switching over to these other things that people needed. And it was unbelievable, just phenomenal what American manufacturing did back when the pandemic hit us. Some of those other things, we started doing that too. There's a, a company I wrote about a few years ago called Detroit Bikes, back in my home state. They make city bikes, so cruisers for just hopping around town. And they were acquired or merged with a 
company called Look Bicycles, high-end racing bicycles. Why did Look Bicycles buy this company in Detroit that was making street cruisers? Because they couldn't get bicycles out of Taiwan, so they're going to make them here. Bicycles haven't been made in America in 20 years, but Detroit Bikes is doing it. There are lots of opportunities like that. Think about all the 3D printing stuff that went on to get some of these respirator parts and things. There's another story out of Michigan where, with some assistance from some of the money that flowed from the federal government, they established a 3D printing network among small manufacturers where they got free 3D printers, people who'd never had 3D printing before, able to use them for their own businesses with the agreement that should we get into an emergency like COVID again, they turn those over and you know, the beauty of 3D printing is you can have networks that just send out the design for parts and they can turn the printers on remotely and be making stuff for respirators or PPE. Amazing stuff. Technology and uh, the American will to do is phenomenal. And so lots of opportunity and that's where Montana comes in. So, you know, Todd talked about going after that opportunity here in Montana. And it's just amazing what you have going on. Think about the business and, and school and government work that has already gone on. It's positioned you very well. You've already made some moves that other people, people can only dream of. And, and this is a competition. It's always a competition. You know that. We're competing with other countries, but you're competing with other states, too. And, and what are the states? that are succeeding nowadays. They're not the ones that are growing their governments. They're the ones that are growing their businesses. Florida and Texas, Tennessee. Not my home state, sadly, where I grew up, where I live now. It's growing its government, and it's going to lose unless it changes its direction. They're turning over a billion dollars to a Chinese company to put a Ford-affiliated battery plant in some of our farmland. It's not the way to do it. The way to do it is what Montana is doing. Make the state more appealing to businesses. Clear out some of the log jams, the regulation, the, the tax burden. I mean, just for workforce alone, you know, if you think about the opportunities for um, just what Todd said around needing to grow that workforce needing to have the people who can do those jobs. Everyone in manufacturing today is talking about the need for people. We can't get enough people to fill our jobs, and especially skilled jobs. That's a real, real challenge. And so when I went out to Bozeman and found that Montana State and Gallatin College were already funneling highly skilled youth into the manufacturing world, into John Suh's uh, business and businesses like that, you know, that's what's going to provide the winners of the future, and that Governor Gianforte and the legislature are already clearing some of those roadblocks and then looking down the road at, at clearing others. A billion dollars, I heard, in individual uh, tax relief. I mean, that's huge, you know. Probably one of the toughest things is just having people come to where you need them. I was talking, so I spent close to half my career with General Mills. I was talking to an old colleague of mine I hadn't talked to in at least a decade couple weeks ago. She's in Buffalo, New York, and been there for 20 years. I knew she had a son who was a little older than my older one, so he had to be in college or his college age, and I asked about him. She says, yeah, he's in college. So now where's he going? He's in Montana, at Montana State. He thought that would be a great place to stay, to live, to go to school, and to stay there, and he loves it. He's been there going on two years now, loves Montana, loves Bozeman, plans to stay in the area. John, maybe future employee. I'll get, I'll get you his info. And then Michelle, my friend, who's been in Buffalo forever, says, yeah, and then my husband and I, you know, we're getting kind of close to retirement. So we're thinking about moving to Montana. So, I mean, Montana's already blessed with great people. I was talking to at the event last night, a young filmmaker. She was phenomenal, what an education that was. I have, I have no read on the filmmaker, filmmaking world. And we got talking about her background. She's from Maryland, moved out here because she thought it would be a cool place, right? 
And she says, yeah, I've been here about four years. And the thing I've noticed coming from out east, you know, went to school in Maryland, uh, got a master's in New York City, and came out here, and people do stuff here. People hunt, and they fish, and they do outdoors things. You know, they don't sit on screens all day. You have doers. What do manufacturers need for employers, or for employees? Doers. So you've got, already got this base of people who know how to do the work. And now you're drawing in other people who want to do the work. So beyond all those business-focused things, you're doing all these right things to take advantage of, you know, first of all, why, why did Michelle's son want to come here? Because it's beautiful. Have you guys looked at this place? <laughs> I fly out here and I'm like, holy cow, maybe I need to move here. It's a gorgeous state and you have great people. Everyone is so friendly. Um, you're just positioned extremely well. Now, you know, I'm not going to say everything's perfect, right? So what are the opportunities for Montana? Um, a few things. So you're going after one right now, and that is the additional business incentives. Okay, so things aren't perfect. You still have to clear those roadblocks. You have to face that you're going to have higher transportation costs in a lot of the country. Um, I understand housing is a difficulty, and so you've got to make it easier wherever you can for people to come here and make a good living and, and um, be happy to stay. And so continuing with that work that Governor Gianforte and the, and the legislature and the business community and the schools have done is huge. Um, the schools is, is definitely another one. Uh, the, the technical abilities, the skilled trades, um, engineering. If you think about manufacturing in America, so many people talk about the decline. And it's true to a degree. There's been a, de a substantial decline in manufacturing employment since about 1970. And that's for a lot of reasons. Um, certainly some of that is because jobs went overseas. Um, we've had whole communities devastated by businesses that pull out and leave and there's no jobs left. We've had whole industries like textiles that have gone overseas. It's like 3% of uh, American but what we wear, our, our clothing, is made in America anymore. But manufacturing output over that same time has been on a steady increase, an increase beating inflation. So to say that manufacturing has been in a decline isn't entirely accurate. Now, how could that be? Well, the answer is we don't have as many jobs because we've automated them, right? And again, you can argue about, oh, Robots are bad, they're taking jobs. Yes, they are, but what I would say is the jobs they're taking are the things like what I saw when I first got to this little Yoplait plant, also up in Michigan where I started with General Mills, where they were still in 1996 having, having people hand stack little yogurt cartons onto pallets for shipping. They don't do that anymore. Nobody wanted to do that job. People made a living at it. Um, that job is gone, but what do they have now? They've got a whole bank of robots doing that work. They've got the operators who run those robots. They've got the maintenance people who service those robots on site. But there's a missing piece. There's the people who designed those robots. There's the people who programmed those robots and installed those robots. We don't count them as manufacturing employees. So I would submit that the jobs are changing and moving to maybe another sector. If you look at overall employment, it's not that dismal a picture. But it, is, it does mean we've got to refocus what we're doing. And so when we talk about Montana State funneling John Sa, uh, his people, they will be manufacturing employees, but only if they learn the right things and are able to do the right jobs. Not the jobs of the past that were dirty and dangerous and dismal. Those are the future where, you know, people are on computer screens and servicing the electronics. They're not hand stacking the yogurt crates anymore, right? Okay, back to James J. Hill, right? Remember him? Why did I bring him up? So one of the things that really sparked my interest when I got to Bozeman and learned a little more about Hyundai establishing there was why they did it. I mentioned the, the terrain and the the school um, providing the skilled uh, employees, um, the affiliation with the school, they're on the innovation campus. But you know what they didn't do? 
they didn't get a big, huge government payout. They didn't get the billion dollars that this Chinese company is getting from Michigan to maybe establish a, a battery plant. Um, so if I look at James J. Hill, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some stuff. So there were five major rail lines at the time when he was establishing the Great Northern Railway. He was the only one who didn't take government handouts. He was the only one who didn't go bankrupt. So I talked about Foxconn. They went into Wisconsin promising thousands of jobs and taking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars back about 10 years ago. And if you go to Racine, where they were supposed to be, you've got a bunch of streets that were built and a bunch of infrastructure that was put in place and no buildings and no work going on. They didn't deliver the goods. Because you have that kind of handout, you don't have skin in the game. John's got skin in the game. He's going to make that work out in Bozeman. And that's, that's what James J. Hill did. So I learned about him from a guy named Larry Reed. He's the president of the Foundation for Economic Education, which if you're not familiar with it, I recommend you look them up and read their stuff because it's phenomenal. But he wrote about James J. Hill and he specifically talked about his tie to Montana because Larry Reed also is a board member of the Frontier Institute here in Helena and writes for them. And first of all, from, from the website, is a historical website of the Great Northern Railway Historical Society, says, Throughout his years of creating, encouraging, and directing, Mr. Hill's creed was development of the resources of the region the railway served. He knew the railway could not prosper unless its territory prospered. So when he established those communities, it wasn't for his own purposes. It was if those communities succeeded, his railway was going to succeed. Not selfless by any means, but also not taking a bunch of money like the other railways did. And the other railways not only went bankrupt, they were busy blowing up each other's lines so that they could get more land grants and more money from the government. While James J. Hill was putting in functional railroad that still operates today. It says, this is from Larry Reed, Hill was unlike Leland Stanford who used his political connections to get the California legislature to ban competition with his Central Pacific Railroad. Hill was happy to compete without political favors because he knew he could. He offered incentives to people to move west and help him develop the area in exchange for hauling their goods. One of those people was Friedrich Weyerhaeuser, heard of him, who built his timber fortune in the northwest in partnership with Hill's railroad. And so, you think about all you guys have going on and you're doing it right because you're doing it in that way. You're doing it like James J. Hill would have done it. I just learned from my buddy Matt Olson with the Chamber today that, um, let me find the right page here. There's centers for excellence that have been talked about and um, so there's a competition right now and it's, uh, today is the deadline for RFIs for a um, CHIPS Act allotment for establishing a center for excellence in high tech and chip making. And yeah, you know, that's taking government money for sure, but think about then, if you establish that center for excellence here, that is just like James J. Hill did. It's establishing a, a different kind of community, a community of manufacturing excellence, of technological excellence. Um, probably heard of a little thing called Silicon Valley, right? So that's one example. That's obviously one that's a little out there for most places. But did you know that, say, um, Rockford, Illinois is the center for gear making in the US? And uh, Wichita, Kansas is the center for aerospace? And little Alexandria, Minnesota is the center for packaging equipment. And all those places have not just the manufacturers that build those things, they've got a huge infrastructure of supporting companies and supporting schools and supporting businesses. That's how you grow your economy, that's how you grow your state, and that's how you win. So, Montana, be like James J. Hill. I'll take any questions. Anyone? Well, I must have explained things really well. <laughs>
Well, thank you for having me. It has been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to the rest of the day. Thanks for tuning in to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vanosky. Watch for new episodes dropping every Tuesday. And don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe.